Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to Ideas for Tomorrow. Hello and welcome to Ideas for Tomorrow. We all know Governor Mike DeWine from his decades of public service to Ohio. Now he's leading the state's response to the COVID-19 pandemic, the biggest challenge in his long and distinguished career and the biggest public health threat in our lifetimes. From the beginning of the outbreak, Governor DeWine has shown that he's unafraid to make tough calls. He was one of the first governors to close public schools, restaurants, and bars, and one of the earliest advocates of mask wearing. He has sought expert advice, asked thoughtful questions, worked to keep Ohioans informed and strive for consensus. He has anticipated problems and responded to fast changing conditions. Cleveland Clinic is proud of our ongoing partnership with Governor DeWine and Ohio's public health officials to fight the pandemic. We work closely together to make sure our citizens have access to testing, treatment, and the best medical information to support decision-making. In my conversations with the governor during the last few months, I've seen firsthand his decisiveness, guided by his concerns for Ohio's well-being. Here is a video to tell you more. A moment that changed life for us all. Breaking news tonight, the coronavirus outbreak declared a global pandemic. Governor Mike DeWine making a historic move by issuing a stay-at-home order for all of Ohio. A pace setter, unafraid to take bold steps. All bars in the state and all restaurants will close at nine o'clock tonight. In a fight to flatten the curve, Ohio proved to be an early model for others to follow. Republican Governor Mike DeWine has been getting national attention for his response to COVID-19. Through it all, Governor Mike DeWine's leadership has become a blueprint for a nation in crisis. After five decades of public service, Governor DeWine's decisive response to the COVID-19 pandemic in Ohio made him a household name. Thank you for giving the people of Ohio that message. I know it's unpopular, but that's what makes you popular as a leader. With extraordinary foresight, he recommended that spectators be barred from indoor sporting events days before U.S. professional leagues decided to delay their seasons. Governor DeWine was also the first in the nation to declare a statewide school shutdown. And even before that, he recommended all colleges and universities suspend in-person classes. From the very beginning, daily 2 p.m. briefings with the governor and his team of public health experts became must-see TV. And viewers reacted with praise and even some creativity. One, two, three, four, five, six feet apart. Stay home. Stay home. How's about we coordinate it? A father of eight and grandfather of 24, Mike DeWine treats Ohioans like his own family. And that same care was taken when it was time to slowly reopen the state. It is essential, though, that as we start back, we do this the right way. We must get this right. Even now, as the battle continues, and cases in some areas increase, he doesn't hesitate to make more tough decisions. Our mask order for people who are out in public will be extended throughout the state of Ohio. In unprecedented times, true leaders emerge. Governor DeWine is guiding Ohio through a crisis with no end in sight, committed to saving lives. He is creating a legacy that will serve as a model for generations of leaders to come. Welcome, Governor DeWine. Thank you for joining us today. Thank you, Tom. Good to be with you. Appreciate it very much. Well, we're delighted to have you. Thank you very much for finding a time from your busy schedule to join us for our virtual ideas for tomorrow. It's much appreciated. Thank you. Uh, so I would like to speak about a COVID pandemic. Obviously, this is the topic, the topic that dominates every conversation. Conversation on ideas for tomorrow, it dominates a conversation in the political forums, uh, news, uh, any media outlet, uh, every conversation around a family table. So when did you realize the severity of COVID-19, the potential threat of the pandemic uh, as a real problem for our country and our state? 
Well, you know, first of all, Tom, um, I want to thank you and the Cleveland Clinic for uh, the work that you have done. Uh, it's been immensely helpful, uh, not only to the citizens of Ohio, but to me personally. I was on a phone call early this morning uh, with, with some of your folks, and there's hardly a day goes by that I'm on the, not on the phone with somebody from the Cleveland Clinic. So thank you for all that, all that you all are doing. Um, you know, I really, I think, was probably first informed about the, the gravity of this. We saw it, of course, on, on TV, China, but um, I was very fortunate uh, that I had picked Dr. Amy Acton uh, to be our head of the Department of Health. And uh, I, I knew we wanted someone who um, really understood public health, had a real passion for it, and had the ability to communicate with the public. But of course, I had no idea that we were going to head into this pandemic. So it, was, it just had no idea. But, uh, you know, the first thing we faced very early on uh, was what's called the Arnold Classic, which is a big event in Columbus in central Ohio. And people from 80 different countries come to that. And, and so at that point, nothing really had been shut down nationwide, uh, no big event. And we just started looking at this event. Uh, and the more we looked at it, the more we thought, this is just not going to work. Uh, you know, we're talking about not only 15,000 athletes, but 60,000 people come in, uh, 70,000 people, spectators. They're there four days. They're within a close proximity to each other. And, uh, you know, talk with Mayor Ginther, uh, Mayor of Columbus. And uh, we came to the conclusion that, hey, we had to do something. And so we actually stopped the event uh, from taking place. We let the athletes come in, but, but no, no spectators. And so that really started us down that pathway. Not long after that, we started, uh, we also had uh, the NCAA basketball coming to Ohio. Not only was it coming to Cleveland in the first round, but before that was the, the play-in games that are always at the University of Dayton. And so we had to make a decision about that. And what we decided was no fans um, you know, they could go ahead and, and, and play the game with the athletes, but no, no fans. Uh, eventually, after we made that decision, announced that, you know, the NAACP, NCAA made a decision not to move forward with the games at all. But so we really had a couple of things teed up very early that we had to make decisions. And I look back at that first decision on the Arnold, and I think, uh, you know, we agonized over that that decision. And this was huge. Nobody was doing anything like this. Uh, but as, as we look back, of course, it looks like it is a, you know, an obvious decision, but uh, it wasn't obvious when we were making it. I'll tell you that. Yeah. yeah. In retrospect, all those decisions seem very, very obvious, but I do remember that one because at that time point, uh, professional leagues were uh, sport uh, sport competition was going on full blast. We were really the first state that signaled the danger of large public gatherings uh, in in sports arenas. But I also do remember then we started our conversations with other healthcare leaders and the members of your team about how to organize the response, a public healthcare response uh, for the state of Ohio. Would you mind just sharing with our audience uh, sure. your thoughts about how should we get organized to protect all Ohio's? Well, I think the key has been uh, for me and for our team is that, you know, we have always pulled in for the discussion uh, health leaders across the state. And, and Tom, as you know, we are blessed in Ohio with some amazing hospitals uh, and with some amazing uh, scientists. And so we started bringing them in. We, we, we brought you in. We brought, uh, you know, uh, UH in. We brought the University of Cincinnati in, Ohio State. And just, you know, these were conference calls. And I, you know, I don't know how many different conference calls that we would have. But again, I'm not an expert, certainly in health. This is not my background. Uh, and so what I wanted to do throughout this is to rely on experts. And so we, we have the experts in Ohio. It's an amazing, uh, amazing thing. Um, and, and part of it was getting data. And this was a little bit into it, but it kind of goes to what you were, I think, referencing. Um, and, and that is, we don't really have a healthcare system in Ohio. We don't have a hospital system in Ohio. Um, we say that, but, uh, you know, historically, hospitals have had a lot of data. Uh, the, the hospital association ha has had that data, but we really needed uh, as decision makers uh, to tap into that data. 
And so that relationship with the Ohio Hospital Association, uh, with the clinic and, and with the other hospitals has just made all the difference in the world. I mean, sometimes it was on the phone with key people like you. Uh, sometimes it was figuring out, okay, how are we going to structure this so the data is coming in? So we're seeing how many people uh, are going into a hospital every day with, with COVID symptoms, how many people uh, ultimately end up in the, in, in the ICU. And, uh, you know, every morning, um, and I take it now for granted as part of my world, uh, but every morning I get a briefing, and, and, and every day I'm looking at that data from the previous day. And I'm looking at how many people are in ICU, you know, how many are in there, how many hospital admissions did we have? Uh, we've even got it now out so that we're getting er even earlier uh, information. Someone goes to a doctor uh, and they're diagnosed with COVID. You know, that it, we start, we're, picking, we're picking that up. And so all that information is just vitally important. And frankly, when it started, we didn't, we didn't have that. And we couldn't have put it together without the hospitals and couldn't done it without people like you. But we couldn't also put it together without your unifying force and, and wisdom in a direction that has really put, put us all together. And it is just a wonderful example how in the times of need we can come together and we can share our, not only data but also our resources for the benefit of our, our communities. But another really interesting aspect of your activity during this pandemic and your effective leadership where you're news briefings that quickly became a must-see TV. <laughs> Have you ever envisioned that you would be doing daily briefings on this topic? And how did you decide to start them, to begin with them? And were you surprised by their popularity? Well, we sort of stumbled into this. I mean, I, I, you know, we did a press conference in Cleveland. We happened to, I happened to be in Cleveland and, you know, basically as this thing was breaking, so we did a press conference, uh, Dr. Acton and I did the press conference. And one of the things I said to the news media that day was, you know, my commitment to you is to tell you what I know, when I know it. And so we kind of set the tone that first day and then we started holding press conferences. And uh, I think we went 40 some straight days where we did not stop. Uh, and, you know, this was Sunday, Sunday through Sunday and, and just, you know, and, and it was just kind of crazy. It was, you know, Groundhog Day, as they say, it was just, you were, it seemed like one day went right into the other. And frankly, you know, I know the Ohio channel was picking it up and I knew some stations were picking it up live, but really, you know, we had no idea that anybody was out there watching this two o'clock in the afternoon. I mean, who in the world is watching, watching this? Well, it turned out that there were a lot of people watching it. And uh, it, it became, uh, uh, I'm, I'm still amazed that people are still watching it. We're only doing it now twice a week. We think that kind of covers the, uh, you know, allows us to cover the information. If we have a breaking story or something we have to talk to the people of the state about or inform them about, we, 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 st we do it an another day. But now it's just basically twice a week. But I'm still surprised, um, you know, when we say, I say something and I get a lot of feedback. And sometimes it's good, sometimes it's bad, but at least we know people are still out there watching. Well, well I think it is important for, for people to know that uh, you do pay attention. Obviously, you share transparently everything that you know about a COVID pandemic. And I think that has been a source of uh, strength for all of us when we are looking at our leadership uh, that is fully informed, that, that is transparent, and that shares the information willingly. I think that is really the power of, of your show. So thank you very much for doing that. Well, I, we think it's important. And, and for example, tomorrow, uh, a little preview of the press conference, we're going to have three university presidents who are going to Skype in. Um, and, you know, because people are seeing this in the news, they're seeing what's going on nationwide. And for them to be able to see three university presidents in Ohio who represent different universities, kind of different, um, you know, public, private. Uh, and we think that that will be a, a good opportunity. We're going to probably next week have uh, have some students uh, Skype in from some of the universities. So uh, just letting people kind of see what's going on out there. As you know, Tom, this is a huge state, you know, seven or eight media markets. Uh, people in one part of the state don't necessarily pay attention to what's going on in another part of the state, just kind of the way it is. Uh, and so this is our attempt, at least, to try to bring people together, unify people, 
uh, give them the, the basic facts. I mean, one of the things that we developed uh, a few weeks ago uh, with your help was the uh, color code of the counties. And this was just a way to let people know, hey, what's going on in your county as far as the COVID? Uh, what are the early signs that we're seeing? What are, the, what are the trends? And so people now can look and see what color their county is every week. And that kind of gives them an idea of what, you know, what challenges that there are out there in regard to the virus. But your success here in, uh, in these news outlets here in the state of Ohio was also reflected in your presence in national news. Uh, and uh, you uh, had quite a bit of presence in national news because of your leadership role here in Ohio. Uh, but one of, uh, one of those news that you generated was that you tested positive for COVID-19 on August 6th uh, while you were preparing for President Trump's visit, uh, yet subsequent retests were negative which was good news. It was a wonderful news for all of us. So how did that experience affect your thinking about testing? Well, it got my attention real quick. Uh, <laughs> you know, I, I, I drove, drove the Cleveland, um, uh, literally stopped by the, the Cleveland Clinic, actually. And then I, then I went uh, to, get the, to get the test. And um, uh, you know, I thought nothing of it. Uh, you know, they were testing. This was a pr test protocol that the White House has. If you're going to be in the presence of the president, you're going to be close to the president. They want you to take a test, which I understand is a quick test. Uh, turned out it was an antigen test. I really didn't pay attention to what kind of test it was. But anyway, they, they did it. And I paid no attention. By the time I got to the airport, uh, I was supposed to greet the president. They said, hey, you can't see the president. You tested positive. So I was uh, rather surprised by that. We got a second test uh, later later that day. And, uh, you know, that, that was a... a, a you know, PCR test and that test came back negative. And then I took another one. And so uh, again, it, it kind of raised an issue. Um, I was happy that it was negative, but it raised an issue about, well, how reliable are tests? And, it, it, you know, so it, it caused me to dig down further to really understand it even you know, better than I did. I'm still not the scientist, but I'm, you know, I've had it explained to me and, um, you know, one thing you take away from that is, um, and you and I have talked about this, but all the different tests that we're talking about, each one probably has a role, um, but they have a different role in how you, how you utilize those tests. And, and that's what we're doing. The test that I took uh, was a very quick test. Uh, you get the results back. They need the results back right away. But there is an error, certainly is an error factor in there that's a lot, a lot greater than the, than the normal P PCR test. And that was part of the message that, uh, I, you know, we had to explain to the people of the state because, you know, the first thing that happened is all the people who doubt the tests, you know, went up on the Internet and said, uh, OK, this just proves that these tests are all junk. And uh, and uh, there's not really some of them were said there's not a virus out there and on and on. So uh, I guess some interesting text. But again, doing it in open, coming out, you know, we said immediately we put this information out that that I had, you know, came back positive. So. If you're transparent, I guess my feeling always has been if you're transparent in the end, you know, the truth is going to win out and, and people will people will sort the truth out and they'll 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 figure it out. And so that's kind of our, our philosophy all the way through this. Well, uh, let's just speak a little bit about the feedback that you're getting from our citizens. Uh, as you said, majority is positive. Sometimes you would get uh, not so positive feedback. And I know that these public health measures are not embraced by all. Uh, and you have faced opposition as well, particularly when it comes to, to maskings uh, and the use of masks in a public setting. So my question to you is, is how do you uh, go, how do you deal with criticism? How do you utilize the feedback uh, that you're getting to improve the state's response? Well, I do get a lot of feedback. Um... Right after I became uh, governor, I gave all the members of the uh, General Assembly my cell phone number, uh, and and one of them a few months ago during this virus texted me, and uh, the member uh, said, uh, uh, "Hey, well, open up the state," and I just kind of texted back and say, "Hey, the state is open," and uh, that particular member of the General Assembly put that screenshot it, put it up, 
And of course, my, my number was there. So uh, my number is available out there. Uh, everybody can go find my, my, my cell phone number. So what that means is I get some pretty raw uh, uh, you know, reaction and that's pretty quick. And uh, people tell me, you know, tell me what they think. Uh, but uh, you know, if you're going to be a governor, and particularly if you're going to be a governor during a 102-year pandemic, we hadn't had anything like this really for 102 years, uh, you, you better be able to make decisions and you better be able to stand criticism. And, you know, the reality is that I'm a pretty good listener. Uh, it doesn't mean everybody that texts me, I agree with them. Uh, but many times, you know, they've got, there's a, there's a point in there and they're telling me something. And so having that feedback is helpful. Even if I don't necessarily agree with what they're saying, at least I'm getting that, I'm getting that, that input. And, and many people who contact me uh, are very, very uh, sincere people. And, uh, you know, they're, they're talking about something that maybe I hadn't experienced or I was not aware of. So you do get good information sometimes. Sometimes it's not so good, but, uh, but, but having that openness and being willing to listen, I, I think is, you know, is part of what a leader should do. And that's, that's what I try to do. Well, I'm certain that you've been getting a lot of feedback about the pandemic, but uh, I'm also certain that you've been getting a lot of feedback about uh, the impact of the pandemic on Ohio's economy. So how are, how are business is doing now? What are your thoughts about the impact uh, on economy and how can we overcome the adverse impact of the pandemic as quickly as possible? Well, this is something you and I've talked about. Um, and I think... Uh, you, you and I uh, are pretty much agreement, uh, and, and that is that, and, and business has told me the same thing, businessmen and women around the state. Um, if we want this economy to, to grow, uh, we have to keep the virus down. And we're not going to get rid of this virus, uh, you know, for a while. We're not going to get rid of it until uh, the medical scientists do their, their great work. Uh, but we got to keep it down and we can't have it have it flare up because when it flares up, um, people die, uh, people get sick. Um, but in addition to that, uh, the people are not are, are scared. And when people are scared, they're not going to go out. They're not going to buy things. They're not the economy is not going to move forward. So so I have looked at this is the preservation of life, keeping people healthy and the economy that we do the same things for all three because the economy cannot come back and we've come back some uh, our unemployment is down from where it, it was we still have people hurting we still have people unemployed we still have companies that aren't back to where we would want them to be uh, but we're making making a comeback and the only way that we can do that uh, is if we keep that virus down because if it flares back up people are going to go on back underground again, basically, and the economy is going to go, go flat. So I don't look at this. I know some people look at this as, oh, it's a choice. It's the economy or, or it's health. I don't look at that that way at all. Um, I think it was clear we couldn't remain shut down. Uh, we were, you see too many other bad things that are going on besides the economy. You, you see mental health problems. Uh, you, you see children uh, that, you know, the number of kids reported for in regard to child abuse goes down. That's not because there's less child abuse. It just means there's no one's putting their eyes on them when kids were not in school. Uh, no third party looking at that child. So a, a lot of bad things happen when you totally shut down. We shut down. We had to do it. But we also had to get back up and start moving, moving forward. And so uh, as I look at this, um, you know, John Houston and I are doing the things that we can do to try to create the environment uh, in the state so business can grow. But my most important job, I believe, is to managing our battle against the virus until it totally goes away, because that's so important for our economy to grow. And it's obviously important to save lives as well. And they're both they're both intertwined. Yeah, I couldn't agree more. We absolutely need to learn how to live and function with the virus that is not going away, unfortunately, anytime soon. And this balance is really, really important. We have to find the balance and we have to change the way we live. So 
speaking about changing the way we live, uh, social distancing has affected every person uh, around the planet. How has this affected your family and your family life and your work life? What is different now compared, let's say, with January of this year? Yeah, well, I'm speaking to you from our home in, in Cedarville, uh, and I'm Fran and I are here, basically. Um, you know, we're doing our uh, press conferences from right here uh, in, in the house. I'm doing, uh, you know, I have in our library there. Uh, we live in an old farmhouse out in the country, and uh, that's where I work. And so, you know, I'm there all day, a couple times a day. Uh, I, as I have conference calls coming up, I just... Uh, my, my dog Dolly and I get uh, out and start walking the farm for an hour and, you know, no one, usually on the conference call, unless they hear the birds or something, they don't know I'm out. It's just, you're on the conference calls. So I spend most of my day on a conference call and conference calls one right after the other. Uh, you know, as far as from a personal point of view, uh, we are very fortunate. Uh, you know, we, we, have, we have a lot of grandkids. Uh, Again, we can see some of them, but what we, you know, what we do is we see them, those who are in the area, uh, we can see, uh, we see them from a distance and uh, certainly during the summer, we see them outside and uh, put a, put a, put our mask on. They have a mask on. We kind of keep a little distance. So I think that's probably the toughest part. Um, you know, the things that you like to do, the things, you know, read a book. Uh, you know, one of the things I like to do is read books to our, our grandkids and, you uh, uh, you know, you can't really do that. Uh, so that's, those are, those are kind of the things that you, you miss, uh, that, that personal, personal relationship. And look, I, I know that it's, there are people watching here, uh, who really suffered. Um, and I mean, really suffered people who've lost their jobs, people who've lost loved ones, uh, people who have been through, uh, the coronavirus and who have, uh, the residue of that, uh, maybe long-term, uh, health, challenges and health problems. Uh, so, um, you know, we're, we're, Fran and I are doing fine and uh, we're, we're very, very fortunate. You know, we've not had the, the, the virus and, uh, you know, that's so far, at least that's, that's, that's been good, but uh, it's, uh, it, it's a, a, a difficult time, I think, for many people. And one of the, one of the challenges we I know that we're seeing out there, we're hearing from people and, and my people in the, who work for me, Lori Chris, for example, who heads up the department um, uh, of mental health. Uh, we know that there's mental health challenges out there and a lot of people are, are really, really struggling with. Well, speaking about children, uh, uh, 24 grandchildren? 20, 24 grandchildren and, and two on the way. So we're very happy about that too. Yeah. <laughs> so 24 soon 26 grandchildren now i'm sure that you can as a as a parent and grandparent you can relate to uh to uh, a dilemma for very many parents uh, that relates to the opening of the schools and uh, so what i wanted to ask is where do you stand on uh, this dilemma between in person versus virtual education it's a difficult question i understand uh, yet it is a, it is a topic of everyday conversation for every person in the country. Well, we have a long tradition in this state of local control of education. So, uh, besides our private schools, we have you know over 630 uh, school districts in the state. And so, what we have tried to do is provide them the best medical information we can, uh, not only uh, about how to get ready for school. Um, how to do the best sanitation, the distancing, and all, all those things. But we've also tried to give them the best information we could in regard to what is going on in their community. Um, and so they're, they've made decisions. Some of them have already started back. Some schools have not started back. Uh, the last I looked, we had about 25% of our students uh, in Ohio who were going totally remote. Uh, we had uh, a, a number of... Uh, who were going kind of a combination. And then I think about maybe, maybe 40% uh, that were actually in person all, all full, full time. And the thing that we've told the schools and the superintendents is, um, you know, you have to be flexible. Uh, if you're going to start back, fine, that's your decision. But if you get a huge outbreak, you'll know it. You'll know if you've got a problem. If you can't put teachers in those classrooms um, or if you've got a lot of kids, you know, and are seeing the spread, you're going to know when you have to pull 
you have to pull back. So uh, again, in, we've done the information about the color of the county. Uh, you know, we've got some counties that are, are red, which is our, our, our basically our level three. Um, four is purple, which is the which is the worst. But we have some counties that are that are level three. And the interesting thing, Tom, is we've seen uh, this kind of spread from the, the urban areas. In fact, the the incidents uh, has, have gone down in the urban areas. Uh, they're still high, but they've gone down. Uh, the rural areas, they flared up uh, in, in a large number of our rural counties. So the f top 10 counties uh, for the spread, uh, you know, recalibrated for population uh, are all rural counties. Uh, Dark County in the eastern, you know, the western side of, uh, of the state, Mercer County in the western side of the state. Those are the first two. Um, and so all 10 of those are small counties. So those schools, uh, most of them that want to open, uh, they want to open in person. Some of them are opening in person. But, you know, we've just explained you've got a big challenge because what you see in the community, what the spread is in the community that's making your county red your school is going to reflect that. Uh, the population of your school, there's just no way it's not. It, it, it's going to reflect that community. And so this is going to be tough. And so, you know, we think we've armed them with the information uh, and we'll have to see how, how this works. I think that, you know, one of the things that is concerning is we do have kids who are going remote. Uh, I think the schools... I know the schools had a lot longer to plan for it this time than they did uh, when we basically pulled the plug, uh, you know, in the spring. And so I, I think the, the quality of the, t the teaching uh, remotely is going to be better. Uh, they've had a long time to think about it and, and to plan it. Uh, but again, there are certain students that we know uh, probably don't do as well. Uh, and so, you know, again, that's one of the things that we, we have to be concerned about uh, our special needs kids, for example. Uh, one of the things that some of our schools are doing, even those who have gone completely remote. In fact, we'll have a uh, we'll have a superintendent tomorrow on our on our two o'clock press conference, and what she'll talk about is how they have they decided to go remote. But the kids who have special needs, they're gonna they're gonna have those kids come into that school at least once a week, um, and on kind of one on one uh, with with that with that teacher, whatever, whatever that child's, uh, you know, disability might be or whether their, their, their challenges are so that they can see that child and interact with the child. And so, you know, we're encouraging all schools that are going to remote to, to you know, worry about the most, uh, you know, disadvantaged among you uh, and those who have the special needs uh, and the kids who really need that, that, extra, that extra help and where it makes, us, makes real sense to, to be there in person. I know that must have been a really, really difficult decision for you to make, uh, and uh, this is just one example of difficult decisions. It is a right decision, but it's a difficult decision to make for anyone. Uh, and I would just like to ask you just to reflect in the course of this pandemic, uh, with all those difficult decisions that one needs to make, I'm sure that there were a few bright spots uh, during the pandemic. Uh, which is the one that comes to mind immediately? Uh, what is, so to say, a good experience, something that really surprised you and excited you as you, uh, you were leading our, our state through the pandemic so far? I, I think you know, the most exciting thing for me is just seeing how people have pulled together. Uh, I mean, this is not something that anyone's had any direct experience about. Um, and and you know, no one living today has had that, that experience. Um, and so... People pulled together, um, and let's be let's be honest. Um, our public health system has been underfunded uh, for a long, long time at at, at all levels of government uh, by both parties, um, and that's that's the reality. And, and so, you know, one of the lessons I think we should take a couple lessons. Um, one is let's never be in a position that for, for a, a PPE and other medical supplies that we have to import everything from some other country. Let's never be in that position. Uh, second, uh, we've got to invest in public health and, and we've got to do it and, and we've got to tie data together and do a better job. So those are kind of 
two long-term lessons, but you know, you talk about the PPE. We've seen companies in Ohio that have turned on a dime uh, that have stopped producing whatever they're making and started producing something that we needed. Uh, I think one of the things that's going to come out of this, you're going to see more Ohio companies that are producing things that we need in the medical community that are used by our own hospitals. And uh, we're, we're, we're really big on that. And uh, I think that's going to be something that's going to be good for Ohio uh, and it's going to be good the next time we face any kind of crisis that we'll we'll have we'll have it here, and we've got manufacturers who are who are geared up. But I, I just think the most important thing is the number of people who have come forward and and, and done things. And look, we we talked about uh, when this first hit, we got to flatten the curve, we got to get on top of this, and we ask Ohioans to do something that you know is very foreign uh, to, to us, and that's stay home, uh, don't go out. Don't do much. Uh, you know, try to do everything remotely. And, and by and large, Ohioans did it. And we got on top of it. And because we got on top of it, and Ohioans did that, you know, we have never seen a huge flare up in Ohio. We've had great tragedies. We've lost a lot of people. Um, but it has been, I can't say it's under control because you never have this virus under control. Uh, totally. But we've been able to, to stay away from some of the great tragedies we've seen in other states where there is a question, is there going to be enough room in the ICU? Are there going to be enough room in the hospital? What are we going to have to do? And uh, because Ohioans pulled together, came together, um, we've, not, we've not had that crisis. We've not had that tragedy. Yeah. And that put us also in a wonderful position to get together, help our fellow Ohioans, but we also helped other Americans who were in need of our help. Well, you had you had, had a capacity to yeah. do so. Well, you had you had nurses go out to New York. I think you had yeah. people go out. I mean, you you. So we're in a position to help other states. And uh, you know, one of the, one of the things, one of the kind of the downside is that you know the 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 big push has always been well, where's the where's the biggest fire we got to put out? And, yeah. and so we've never been the fire. Uh, and so. You know, but that's okay. We don't want to be the fire. <laughs> so, we don't want to be the fire. That's no. a good problem. It's a good problem to have. You know, yeah, not to well, be yes. the fire. <laughs> yeah, exactly right. <laughs> no, I thank you very much. That would just like to turn over to some of our questions from the audience. They were submitted ahead of time. Sure. So, uh, one is uh, about the topic of mental health that we you touched upon uh, briefly, and uh, this concern about the mental health and isolation. And what can we do to support uh, fellow Ohioans with mental health concerns? We came up with something we call Strive for Five, and it was kind of a challenge to all Ohioans to, you know, reach out, uh, if you can, to five people every day. Uh, and people maybe who are isolated in some way in their home, they can't get out, don't get out because of uh, their age, or they don't get out because they have a medical problems. So that's something that that we've been uh, asking people to do. Uh, we also launched, uh, and I'll just read a couple of things here, a new 24-7 uh, emotional care line, our Ohio COVID care line, which is, I'll read the number, 800-720-9616, uh, is staffed with licensed professionals who are ready to talk at any time and connect people with ongoing care uh, if, if they want to do that. Um, so, you know, we also have um, uh, what we call Be Present campaign, and this encourages young people to be there for one another. The Be Present Ohio website offers resources for teens and young adults to learn how they can care for their mental health in stressful times. And so these are just some of the things that, that we, we are trying to do. But, you know, I guess the message uh, always is if someone is having mental health challenges, you know, reach out, reach out for, for help. And for the rest of us, uh, you know, let's try to stay in touch with people who, um, you know, are isolated. Uh, and, you know, one of the, the, the toughest things, um, you know, you talked about tough decisions, um, kind of gut wrenching decisions is when, you know, we close the nursing homes to visitors. And, you know, every medical professional said that's what we need to do. Well, we did it. But then, you know, after a couple of months, I started, you know, talking with people, uh, family members who would tell me about their loved one uh, and who was in a nursing home and, you know, nursing home, that person might've had dementia. They might not have understood why no one was coming to visit them. Uh, and so that, you know, we then 
after a while decided, let's try to figure out how we can have some visitation so people can can start visiting their loved ones. So it's it's as you know, Tom, it's it's a balance. How do you balance the total safety? But at the other hand, uh, if someone is is you know really uh, depressed, um, if somebody is going downhill, we got to try to help them. And maybe one of the ways to help them is to open it up so they can have some visitors under, you know, a, a safe way. So um, all those things connect to our our own mental health and the mental health of our loved ones. Yeah. Well, Governor, thank you so very much. Thank you very much for the conversation. But on behalf of all of us, thank you very much for leading Ohio through this pandemic and everything that you do day in and day out uh, for all of us. Thank you very, very much. Well, thank you. And thanks for all you and the Cleveland Clinic do and our other partners around the state. Uh, it makes a huge, huge difference. Um, and, you know, look, uh, as, you, as we plan for the, the future, um, one of the great assets, people ask me about Ohio, and I say, look, one of the great assets we have is some amazing hospitals, some amazing children's hospitals, uh, health care, uh, and scientists in Ohio. And, and we are blessed, and I have gotten to meet more of them during this pandemic. So that's one of the fringe benefits, <laughs> at least for me, is the opportunity to talk with so many people on a regular basis who are really helping us get through this. Well, it, it is our honor and privilege so thank you very much again. And I would like to thank also our audience for being the part of this event. We have an exciting lineup of future guests for our ideas for tomorrow. On September 2nd, we'll be joined by Judy Faulkner, founder and CEO of Epic System. On September 16th, business and government leader, Valerie Jarrett, the former senior advisor to President Barack Obama will be speaking with us. On September 21st, Tim Brown, chair of the design firm Idea. And on September 2nd, Melody Hobson, co-CEO and president of Aerial Investments and an authority on financial literacy. I hope you'll join us and I thank you. <music>